Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience. We're ready to get started. Okay. I'm very, uh, very pleased to introduce uh, Greg Scheid, president of ABB Americas, and Peter uh, Terwish, from a uh, president of ABB Process Automation, who's going to speak to us this afternoon. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Paul, and thank you, everyone, for joining us this afternoon, and a special thanks for ARC for hosting what will be another terrific industry forum here in 2016. Before we start, as we do at all of our sessions at ABB, whether it's internal or external like this, we pause for a safety moment. I think you know the layout of the room. We have exits in the back of the room. There's also an exit up here. Uh, don't stop at Starbucks on your way out. We're not, <laughs> expecting, we're not expecting any any emergency alarms, but it won't be a practice drill if there is one. Uh, what I personally noticed when we have meetings like this is there's a lot of bags, and they're usually left in the areas where you walk. Uh, so if you can tuck your bags underneath the tables, that also is a, one of the tripping hazards. So uh, with that, I'll get started. Uh, just a couple of comments to put things in context before we turn it over to Peter Turwish, my colleague from the Executive Committee of ABB, and we're proud to have Peter in here supporting this event. Uh, some comments on ABB. We call it our next level strategy in terms of taking ABB to the next level as we look out over the next few years. We introduced this a couple of years ago uh, at our Capital Markets Day in London. And with that, we start by explaining ABB in simple terms because we've grown so deep and so broad that sometimes it's good just to refresh who we are, uh, what we do, and where we do it around the world. So our two core businesses are power and automation. That, that's fundamentally what's behind our portfolio and what we offer. Uh, many of us uh, in the room know ABB from years gone by. Uh, may know us from one side or the other. But if you put it in perspective, about 40% of our revenue comes from the power part of our portfolio, about 60% coming from the automation. We do that for three sectors on a macro level. There's many sectors underneath. Peter will touch on some of those sectors today. Uh, on the utility side, obviously involved in power gen all the way through the grid on T&D and out to the point of use. On industry, many, many industries we serve. Uh, it's roughly half of our revenue. And then what we call transportation, and infrastructure, and on that transport piece, it's marine, it's rail, uh, it's many things include charging of vehicles. Uh, on the infrastructure side, it involves uh, buildings. It also gets involved in data centers in terms of what we do, and we do it around the world. And you can see now our portfolio is about, on the trading zones of the world, about one-third, one-third, one-third roughly. Obviously, here running the Americas, it's been one of the areas we've been growing very significantly over the last five years organically and through acquisition. And when you think of us in terms of total turnover, about 36 billion in sales uh, with customers in 100 countries and doing that with 135,000 employees. And you may have seen last week, I won't go through a lot of our credit ratings, but uh, we had our quarter and year end uh, results last week. Uh, our value proposition and our purpose is met, is met here in our vision of who we are and what we do, and it's been relevant for us for some time. I think it's just as relevant today and will be uh, for the future, and that is power and productivity for a better world. Obviously, helping our customers through the efficient use of power, reliably, safely, uh, also from a productivity standpoint, driving automation uh, throughout many, many industries, and really doing that with a purpose for a better world in terms of sustainability. Today's talk that Peter will give in just a minute is around what we're doing in innovation with the Internet of Things, Services, and People. But if you look at our, our heartbeat, our DNA at ABB, pioneering and technology has been with us from the beginning. And I won't go through all the steps, but you can see as <laughs> much as robotics, for instance, is being talked about today, and we're certainly a major player in industrial robotics, uh, we've been in the robotics business going back 50 years. And it's something that maybe we can argue the pace of change is moving faster than ever. It <laughs> certainly is. But it's something that we've pioneered the way on the grid with HVDC. And you can see how far back that goes. 
uh, also with robotics, with software, with control systems. So this is a big part of who we are, what we do, and what we'll continue to do going forward with our pioneering spirit. So let me introduce our featured speaker today. I think many in ARC and in the industry know Peter. Peter Turwish is the president of the Process Automation Division, uh, sits in Zurich sometimes, usually traveling quite a bit, uh, and we're proud to have Peter here. Peter is 22 years in ABB, has had many, many roles that I won't go through all of those, uh, but one role in, in addition to the operating roles he's had in running different parts of our business, he was also our chief technology officer. So Peter Turwish sits on our executive committee uh, in Zurich as a colleague of mine, and I'm very glad to have you here, Peter, and let me turn the stage over to you at this time. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. And uh, looking around the room here, uh, I recognize many of you and uh, also recall many good discussions we've already had together uh, with you on what the Internet of Things, services, and people, what the fourth industrial revolution actually is or will be, uh, and how AVB participates in that. Let me tell you that from my perspective, Industry 4.0 is about enabling business innovation through how we digitally connect the things, the services, and the people. And it's an exciting topic, both for me personally, as well as for us at ABB, uh, with more than 125 years as a company, uh, born around the time of the second <coughs> industrial revolution, basically, uh, even when you're 125 years old, you don't, you don't get to see that many revolutions. Uh, we all, I guess, recall uh, the, the thir third industrial revolution, and now to be part of and in the middle of uh, the fourth industrial revolution is absolutely a very exciting time. Since at ABB we, we talk about the IOTSP, and, and that's a bit of a difference to some of the other people, uh, who are involved uh, with these changes. Let me tell you, let me tell you why we do that. Uh, in terms of the things, it's probably going to be next year that uh, will be the first time when there will be more connected things on this planet than there will be people living on the planet. Uh, if you look at the services, both the people as well as the things need as well as uh, can provide services. Uh, so that's... Uh, clearly also an undebated part, but we think the people dimension of it is really important for success here because connecting, supporting, and ultimately empowering people uh, and the art of balancing the corners of this triangle will be uh, what is really decisive in creating value from this revolution. We all understand the trends of the digital world. So I won't spend time here. You've heard this one uh, often enough, and it could probably recite that better than I could. Um, and uh, you also know for the industries that we are serving, uh, what they're looking for is basically always about safety, productivity, energy efficiency, uh, or uptime speed and yield. If you just take the, the productivity dimension and zoom in one level more. And if you look at this chart and each of its columns, you can see that basically uh, you find different names, you find different nuances uh, when we talk about cloud-controlled irrigation systems, cloud-controlled electrical vehicle charging networks, the integrated operation across process automation, um, as well as uh, the power side across operations as well as service and also the automated container ports and integrated vessel and even all fleet management, or simply back home in everyone's lives, the increasingly smart homes that we can surround ourselves with uh, today. There is one common theme throughout all that, and that's the IOTSP, the Internet of Things, Services, and People is really happening as we speak and happening across the industries with solutions small as well as large. And let me take you through some examples. If, if you take this one here, this is actually a mine that is older than ABB. Uh, this is a mine that dates back to the 13th century, uh, Gartenberg, uh, a mine of uh, Boliden as a mining corporation. And basically today it is uh, not only the most integrated, 
but probably the most productive mine after a number of technology changes that we've implemented there. And if I uh, just sketch this out, then basically this is about removing people from the danger zone and moving smarter sensors, better actuators, uh, and collaborating of those things and the people and services together to actually produce more tons uh, of ore per person than any comparable mine. Uh, and at the same time on the energy efficiency side, rather than ventilating at full power all the time, uh, basically ventilating as needed in specific sections of the mine for the people, for the equipment that is there at certain times. And basically you improve on all these counts, on the safety, on the energy efficiency, and on the productivity, because rather than the people going down uh, into the mine, uh, drilling holes, planting explosives, evacuating out of the mine, doing a blasting, going back into the mine, uh, basically, you can see how that's actually causing a, a lot of non-productive time. By removing people from the danger zone, you basically get a much more continuous production uh, out of this process, which helps on all three dimensions. If you take another industry, and uh, you, you'll, by the way, I see several of you taking photographs. Uh, you receive this stack from uh, Laura, so we, we will have that as a PDF for you. Um, if I take this pulp example that you see here, this is a new pulp mill uh, that is currently being built in Brazil, and it's an integrated solution for the power, the automation, the process side, but it's not only an integrated system uh, for the new mill that they're building, but it's actually also uh, for the already existing uh, mill that's already right next to it. It'll be one integrated control solution for the whole thing. Um, and if I've now given you two examples of rather large integrated automation solutions, actually the hero of this slide um, and of this application case, a, a distributed oil and gas production <coughs> setup in need of power is actually a low voltage breaker. And, and you would say, what? Uh, aren't we talking serious staff process control systems here? Actually a low voltage breaker these days, our Emacs 2 breaker has the capability of automating the connected loads and basically is able, by energy managing the connected loads, but to, to, to tell them, look, we're going to have a surge if you guys consume uh, power like this, so please actually reduce and, and you go off uh, so that I don't have to trip the whole branch here uh, in terms of maintaining stability, avoiding uh, surges, consuming too much power uh, and, and the breaker actually does that in, in seven different languages if I can call it, call it that. So when we're talking the internet of things and, and when I see some people sometimes also saying well is it for real, is it coming? I certainly didn't imagine even in my time as chief technology officer when we built prototypes of that nature that we would see these internet of things technology in objects like low voltage breakers in production so fast and this is not pilot cases we're having many of these applications already today and when we talk services and people um, and the examples are really as spectacular as you get when you when, when you look at uh, real big systems but actually I find this one uh, stands for exactly what we mean by the services and people side so this is an FPSO, and they're having a problem with a drive somewhere in, in the, uh, the offloading uh, section of the FPSO. So actually at some point that's uh, negative, a dense production. So since the crew actually doesn't have the ability to find out what's wrong with that particular drive, both the, the crew, they get in touch with uh, our support center and together they look at the data from the drive, so the support center uh, get in a connection to the drive, they get a connection with the crew, um, and then basically they can sort out what was the, the root cause of the issue here uh, with the expertise of the drives guys looking at the data in, in detail, and then actually helping the crew to deploy spares that they have on board of the vessel to restore the situation in less than five hours and with just minimum production loss. I, I think that's really a great example of people and things getting together uh, through the IoTSP and, and then delivering value for a customer who would have otherwise 
uh, lost a lot of production uh, in this uh, setup. Now, um, from my perspective, the integration of things, uh, services, and people, we haven't talked much about the people yet, but I think that's a, a really big part of it. So I'd like to talk about the people a bit more, and you know uh, that we've uh, last year completed the acquisition of CGM, a company that is specialized on this people part, on creating intelligent ergonomics for the 24-7 operations environment in order to actually help operators stay healthy, stay alert, and uh, I think it's important that we recognize the other dimensions, the things and, and kind of the connecting networks and then with that many of the services, they all scale pretty well with Moore's Law. But we as people, we don't. So if we really want to have a balanced triangle between the Internet of Things, services and people, the people part, how we connect people, how we keep them motivated, how we keep them healthy in an environment of increasing automation and connection is a key topic and, and that's something uh, we really want to uh, continue focusing on. Um, a typical pattern, if I stay on the people side, that we see in the Internet of Things, Services and People is this collaboration triangle uh, between, uh, well, in the graphics I'm using here, between the crew on the ship, but this could just as well be the crew in the mine, mill, plant, you name it, um, and their uh, be it corporate headquarters, be it specialized engineering pool, be it fleet management or asset management, depending on the industry, and then our operations center supporting them. Um, that collaboration triangle is something we see uh, increasingly and in a lot of cases. To give you an example um, of a contract, and that's why I used the marine slide here, that we won uh, in late last year, uh, for AP Muller Marish, uh, the largest uh, container uh, operator, we won a significant contract that basically uh, looks at how do you efficiently route a vessel and a fleet of vessels, so we're working with both the crews as well as the uh, fleet management center here, how do you route them in view of energy consumption, in view of weather, what weather does to waves, what waves do to the hull, and what actually disturbances to the hull do to the cargo on, on board of the vessel so that you can get there in the most timely, energy efficient, and, and safe, and from a cargo point of view, um, intact uh, perspective ever possible. So that's a significant part that's playing just in this triangle, uh, and that's actually a contract that's not a hardware delivery contract at all, it's a uh, things, services, and people kind of contract, which I think exemplifies what I'm trying to say here. Now, if we look ahead, I mentioned it in the beginning, uh, if you look at current numbers of connected devices, I don't think it's uh, going to be much longer than next year that we will see more connected devices on this planet than people living there. Uh, and a lot of other supporting trends are also going in the direction. Uh, that the Internet of Things, Services and People happens right here as we speak and making the difference from these possibilities is then what really counts in terms of focusing on customer outcomes, on safety, productivity and energy efficiency, on uptime speed and yield from intelligent infrastructure, engineering from software and services. So, ladies and gentlemen, let me wrap up here. I think it's a great time to be in automation. Many of the technology limits that, uh, looking around the room, I can say we all grew up with, they're going away. And I personally am convinced that the best way to predict what the Internet of Things, Services and People will be is to create it. Thank you. Do we have any immediate questions? Uh, in the UK, there seems to be still um, quite a, uh, a restricted amount of companies in the, in the small to medium size uh, that want to really put the investment into automation that, that is really required for them to, 
to move to industry 4.0. How are you going to get some of those guys that aren't even close to, to the third uh, industry uh, stage yet? What's, what's the strategy there? Thanks. Uh, let me repeat the question for the recording. So the question was how, especially the small and medium enterprises in the example of the question from the UK, would have a chance in actually uh, getting to the fourth industrial revolution, even though some of them are not uh, yet entirely through with the third one. Let me, let me give you examples here. And uh, I, I really, one of my favorite examples isn't a process automation example, but a discrete manufacturing example. When, when I was starting to look in, in our German business that I used to run, when I was starting to look for orders in which actually the business innovation side enabled by connecting the things, the services, and the people, uh, where would this already be happening? I actually found some orders in our robotics business where uh, people were innovating the model of how you produce shoes in that basically they were offering a website. On that website you could custom design your own shoe based on the geometry of your foot, based on the preference for colors and, and various other features of the shoe. And then they would basically use that information that you entered yourself there um, to basically automatically generate a robot program and the robot together with a machine would then produce the shoe. And, and these are not huge companies that do this, um, but these are actually uh, small and medium-sized enterprises who are having a business innovation idea. Some of them are leapfrogging the third industrial revolution much in the way as in emerging markets you find people are not actually going through first the fixed line telephone and then the mobile phone, but they go mobile directly. I'd say it's very much that. And if you look what it does for the industry, though, um, it basically eliminates the whole inventory carrying cost and the whole inventory risk. So rather than actually producing these um, shoes in a remote country and then having them on, on sea freight, uh, spending weeks or maybe even months uh, in, in transit, and then at the end of the season you found out uh, nobody liked size uh, whatever, size 10 and a half in, in green, so you scrap a lot of inventory. Uh, instead of all that, basically you deliver customized, so probably with a price premium, exactly what the consumer wanted and there is no scrap in the process and actually also smaller players uh, near shore or onshore can play the game that had increasingly become an industry that was entirely an off offshoring play. So I think there's huge opportunity uh, for small, medium, and large enterprises, and it's about the business innovation based on uh, the technology trends that will make the difference here. Yes, please. You uh, mentioned remote diagnostic services, uh, one of your chase examples. Uh, it, it seems to me that ABB probably has a lot more things, you know, than, than many other suppliers out there. You, you have a full range of motors, drives, you know, field instrumentation, and so forth. Could, could we look forward to a new, maybe some new offerings in terms of remote uh, diagnostic management, condition monitoring uh, from ABB moving forward? Or yeah, basically you can look back. You can look now and you can look forward yeah. to a new offering in the space of remote diagnostics as well as services around that. I mean, the example of the marine vessel I used was one. Uh, and instead of talking about a drive, I could have talked about medium voltage switch gear and the connected relays there. Uh, instead of the marine vessel, I could have talked about the more than 5,000 robots that we already have connected today. So. Uh, that actually you can remotely, and, and by the way, these robots, the, the ones we have under these contracts are very often in small and medium enterprises, so they have no robot technician, they have maybe three, four robots, and we have a contract with them that actually helps them, uh, the speaking robot can say, look, in, in my axle number three, I'm starting to feel a bit more slack, and it's about time somebody in the next 72 hours comes and does something about it in, in terms of uh, whatever, lubrication or a certain spare part. Um, so that kind of contract we have, and, and uh, we're increasingly uh, for assets 
that we've uh, supplied to customers as well as for other assets, we're increasingly in service relations where we look after an entire fleet of such assets and have experts at be it gearless mill drives and mining, or be it entire marine vessels and all the connected things that you have on board, and, and then uh, people who support that. So it, it, it's, it's there today, but it, it's a trend for more, so uh, definitely a space to keep an eye on. Yes, please. Hey, when you were talking about how it's, the technology is not in the way anymore, things are changing as well as possible, what do you see as the, it's not technology, what is maybe the top, top three obstacles to doing more um, uh, IoT type of solutions? Is it, is it concerns over cybersecurity, cultural issues, um, ability to justify the investments? Uh, what, what do you see in, in numer numeric order, one through three or whatever? <laughs> Yeah, okay, uh, again, I repeat the question. So the question is about the obstacles. If the obstacles are not technology, are they in, in cybersecurity, are they in cultural acceptance, uh, or, or wherever else? And first of all, I have to say, maybe I was simplifying as, as an ex-technologist, maybe I was simplifying too much. So clearly there is tons of technology challenges in the details and opportunities for for getting this right, getting it even better. There's also the question of uh, at, at which point do you want to standardize versus where do you want to innovate and differentiate. Um, so all the lessons learned in previous waves of technology, including the introduction of digital field buses uh, and all that, that still applies. Having said that, I would still say uh, much of the innovation is going to be business innovation. Uh, in terms of what do we do with that digital information uh, in order to better connect the, the things, the services, and the people. Um, you mentioned cybersecurity already. Definitely that's one that must be right because especially in the industries we're serving, we're talking about mission critical 24-7 equipment. Um, so cybersecurity uh, is a must and I would resist the temptation of putting it somewhere in a ranked list because it's just a must. Um, the, the other part, yes, the, and, and I can almost echo the, uh, the, the proposed answer you, you gave me with the question. If, if you look at the cultural acceptance dimension, I think it varies very much by society. We're having great experience with ABB's Yumi robot. We have a, we've launched a collaborative two-arm robot that basically doesn't need a fence between the robot and the person. So you can really literally work elbow to elbow safely with each other, uh, which is a complete departure from decades of robotics paradigm that you have to treat a robot like a wild animal that needs to be locked up in a cage. Um, so I, I think so through such technologies, we're really making progress also on the cultural side because we've seen a number of uh, people, both highly prominent people, uh, as, as, as well as uh, just uh, pe people who happen to come by, try to, to stick their finger into the gripper or, or yeah. kind of uh, touch the robot with the elbow to see what happens. So I, I think people are getting more used to these technologies, but not at a uniform speed. And I, I think we have to respect that. And, and then the, the part that I mentioned about ergonomics, I mean, when your automation systems get more and more powerful, if you do the statistics of, of any major industrial customer and the number of loops that today uh, a single operator oversees, from any of them you will get statistics that show an, a, an enormous increase how many loops today a single operator uh, is actually looking after. And uh, at the same time, we're still the, the human beings more or less the way um, the previous generation was, which you can't say of the technology. So making sure that in an environment of more capable automation, humans remain engaged, they remain healthy, they have the optimal support uh, from an intelligent infrastructure uh, that I, I really see as a very important priority because I don't believe for a second in completely lights out factories. Uh, that has been envisioned in the 80s, it's, it's failed in the 90s. Um, but I do believe in, in really empowering people with the internet of things, services, and people. Thank you, Peter.
Chair, we, we, we don't mean to interrupt you, but we have run out of time. 